All right, well, welcome back. This is Mr. DeSico, and uh, I'm going to take you guys through uh, the first two presidents. So uh, today we'll be looking at the major events that happened under uh, President George Washington, uh, started in 1789, and uh, John Adams, the Federalist president, shortly thereafter. So let's, uh, let's get it going. Uh, putting the Constitution in effect. So the Constitution we it was created, it was ratified. Uh, if you, you, you watched the last video on the ratification debate and eventually the uh, the Bill of Rights, the subsequent rights that came out there, this is it. I mean, we, we, we have a system, we elect a president, and uh, today we're going to see what he does, right? So George Washington's administration. And when you see that word, I know we've defined it in our classes, uh, that is just specific to the major events that happened while George Washington was the president. So what are his objectives and what did he want to do? All right. Uh, first things first, he wanted to create a sound financial foundation for the country. All right. We had to set up our finances. Uh, so, to, you know, put us in a good place. I mean, we owed people money when we began our nation. We owed the French, we owned the Dutch, and we owed rich Americans. So, uh, second bullet point here was establish a solid political system. Make sure that the system we created actually works. All right. Ensure national security through foreign policy decisions. We're going to find out that, uh, you know, Georgia's major foreign policy is simply to stay neutral. All right. Uh, and then we, we have these other things that pretty much can just kind of develop because of what our early presidents did, all right? So this is something known as the unwritten constitution, all right? And then these little things evolved from our first presidents as a, a result of the changing times, the changing needs, the things that the, the country was into. So a couple examples of the unwritten constitution for you guys is going to be the development of political parties, the uh, use of a presidential cabinet, and uh, those sorts of things, all right? Uh, vocab, I'm going to throw the vocab in the videos for you guys. So, I mean, if you want on a separate sheet of paper, write those down. Uh, it'd be nice to have at the end, and then you're pretty clear as to what you need. So, uh, I'm not really going to talk about these slides, but it's there for you. Unwritten Constitution, there's the definition, right? Copy it, study it, got to know it, all right? Uh, what are some examples, all right? Well, the executive interpretations and, and, and other actions of the president have pretty much uh, allowed us to see what else a president can can do besides what's written down in the Constitution. And I'm going to give you a little examples of each one of those, okay? Uh, Executive Order 9066 was uh, our President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He basically ordered uh, all people of Japanese descent or Japanese heritage after Pearl Harbor to uh, move on to these little uh, concentration camps, relocation camps. And uh, he didn't ask for permission, he just did it. All right, so it shows you that the power of a presidency, especially uh, during uh, during some crazy times, right? Uh, congressional interpretations and actions. So the the necessary and proper clause kind of alludes us to. I know this is actually written down in the Constitution, but you know certainly some of the other things that Congress gets into, uh, they simply say they're doing it because they need it, such as maybe committee systems. All right. Um, you know, the court decisions, judicial review, that's something that uh, is definitely uh, it just kind of came about, all right? Um, and the one you better know is Marbury versus Madison, 1803. Judicial review is an example of the unwritten Constitution. Why? It's simply not in the Constitution, and it happens afterwards, all right? Uh, any of the customs and traditions that a president may do, and I'm going to refer to these as precedents. Precedent's kind of a fancy term for uh, we do something once and then it becomes a nice tradition and it becomes something that works, so we do it over and over and over again. The biggest example would be a president's cabinet. All right, so Washington originates the idea of having a four-member cabinet, four advisors to help him run the country. Every president since then has had one. All right. Uh, the two-term presidency was kind of a precedent set by Washington that changes under, obviously, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And you see him another example. Um, no one knew what to call the president, so Washington said, just call me Mr. President, and that's what people do, right? Um, and then you got political parties, right? We have the two-party system in America. The two major political parties are Democrats and Republicans, all right? Uh, once again, vocabulary, you got to know what a cabinet is. So a group of officials who had the government departments, and what do they do? They advise the president, all right? 
First year as a new governor, we're going to give you like a nice little timeline here of just some major events. So 1789, Constitution has been ratified. Washington becomes the first president, right? 1792, obviously it's kind of a, a good thing. The country is growing. Kentucky was part of uh, the Northwest Territory. Now it becomes a state. And obviously we, we have a system for that called the Northwest Land Ordinance, all right? 1794, event that you should know for Washington, which is the Whiskey Rebellion. A uh, bunch of people that don't want to pay their taxes in, in Pennsylvania, and uh, George Washington goes down to that rebellion with the Federal Army and, and basically tells them people to pay their taxes. And uh, by doing that, he shows us that the government can make laws, it can also enforce the laws, all right? Jay's Treaty, uh, you should know, is a treaty with the, the British, and then you have the Treaty of Greenville, which uh, the, uh, the Miami Indians and uh, other Native American groups lost land in the Ohio River Valley. All right, 1796, John Adams is elected president, so he takes over uh, the second president. Uh, he deals with the XYZ affair and the Alien and Sedition Acts, which uh, I'll deal with later on in the presentation. Uh, Jefferson is elected president in 1800. John Marshall is Chief Justice, 1803. We get judicial review. Uh, and there it is, Marbury versus Madison. Also in 1803, the Louisiana Purchase. So these are, you know, just some major events that were happening in America's early years, all right? And then the other, the bank case, 1819, McCullough versus Maryland, uh, basically proves that the federal government's laws are more powerful than state laws, all right? So you got to get that. Executive decision making. So when we talk about executive decision making, we're obviously referring to our president, the executive department. Okay, so what did Washington do? He creates a four-member cabinet. All right, all presidents seek the advice of these executive departments. All right, what are executive departments? It's a fancy way of saying what? The president's advisors or his cabinet. All right. Uh, at first, it began as kind of these informal gatherings, little, little meetings, little, little chats. Uh, obviously, today, when the president meets with his cabinet advisors, it is very formal. There is a schedule, and, uh, you know, they, they, they deal with the issues that America is facing, all right? Uh, president can appoint anyone he wants to head these cabinet members, but the Senate approval is needed. All right, so he, I mean, he, he can pick anyone who wants to be the Secretary of the Treasury, but the Senate have to still agree with uh, his pick. So, if, I mean, if he picks someone who, I don't know, doesn't know anything about banking, doesn't know uh, anything about his own finances and deeply in debt and, I don't know, declared bankruptcy 50 times, the Senate would say, you know what, that guy's probably not the right guy to be uh, the, the Secretary of the Treasury. And they would just tell the president to pick someone else, all right? Uh, he can dismiss cabinet members without their approval. So... He can fire a cabinet member, and then, obviously, he's got to hire a new one. But his new hire, he's got to get approved by the Senate. So that, that's the process there, all right? The original cabinet is four members. Today is 15. I think I got some visuals for you, okay? There's Washington. There's the first cabinet. you got the Secretary of State, Foreign Affairs guy, Thomas Jefferson, Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. You know how I feel about him. Love him. I think he was pretty smart for the country. Uh, Secretary of War, Henry Knox, and then obviously the Attorney General was Edmund Randolph. Uh, when you look at the cabinet today, it has grown in size. I mean, take a peek. We went from four-member cabinet to 15-member cabinet. So when you look at the, uh, the different cabinet positions today, these positions have uh, kind of came about when our nation experiences some trouble. So the president needs help. So the final cabinet position, easy to remember, the Secretary of Homeland Security. And that cabinet position was created after September 11, 2001. But you get the other cabinet members in there. It's pretty nice, right? Executive decision making. What else is the president doing? Well, he consults with uh, Congress on uh, policy development. So basically, Congress and the president together are running the country. All right. Um, it's normally in, in the Constitution, it was seen as uh, the Senate must advise the president and consent with, with his process, with his decisions. Well, uh, today, as we see, the Senate's role seems more to consent than advise. So basically, they don't tell him what to do. He just runs the country, and they either agree with what he's doing or there's a process called congressional oversight. They can kind of tell him to, to cool his jets a little bit. So um, that's kind of the role that the Senate has today, all right? Let's talk about Hamilton's plan, because out of all those four cabinet members, the one guy you have to know is Alexander Hamilton, all right? Why is he so important? 
He set the nation's finances up. Uh, I think it was pretty smart uh, in terms of what he advised uh, Washington to do. And uh, he basically handles our debt. I mean, he, he did a phenomenal job of that. So what's his deal? Alexander Hamilton, he is the Secretary of Treasury. That's the money guy, right? He develops a plan. It's got four key elements to fix our finances. And he, he does every one of these things, all right? The first one is assumption. Uh, at this particular point, states were the ones who were in debt. And Hamilton's theory was that he wanted the national government to pay that debt off. He didn't want the states to do it. He didn't want the citizens to do it. He wanted the national government to pay that debt off. A couple of reasons why he wanted to do that. Number one, if the national government owed people money, people would make sure that the government sticks around long enough so they can get their money. So the one thing that Hamilton did was he assured that our government would last. All right. Uh, he believed the assumption of debts would establish the credit of the nation. How? In terms of establishing credit for the federal government. Smart move. Congress approved. He gets it done. Uh, the second part of his plan uh, called for the new federal government to pay off those those debts uh, that the Continental Congress had. So that's what the, there's your vocab there if you needed it. Let me go back for you. There it is. You know, uh, you should know what that that assumption that part of the assumption plan was. All right, the term assumption. That's Hamilton. So there, there's your vocab slide for you. Uh, the second part of his plan developed that national bank. He wants Congress to create a bank for the country. Why? It's going to do a couple things. It can win the new government the support of the business community. Why? If you want to build a factory, if you want to buy some, some land, you can go to the federal bank and borrow money. It's a great place. You pay the federal government back plus interest, and they're making money, right? Uh, it would help the government in all of their financial dealings. So that's a smart move, right? Congress agreed. So, dude, we're going to build you a national bank. Uh, we're going to do this because it's necessary and proper. This also is giving the federal government more power. It's allowing the government to do more. Some people didn't like that. The the other political party, the Jeffersonians, are not going to like that. But, hey, Hamilton said, listen, I think this is good. We should do it. We do it. And I believe that bank is chartered for 20 years. So we'll have to deal with that national bank later on in our history. There's your vocab. You got it. Looking good. Moving on. You can go back to that slide if you need it. I'm, I'm moving. Um, third part of the plan. We're going to tax. Uh, our Constitution says that Congress can collect taxes. So Hamilton said, hey, the government needs money. What are we going to do? Let's tax. Uh, he proposed raising revenue through an excise tax, it's called. Well, what is an excise tax? It's a direct tax on a certain product, right? Uh, and at this point, he was taxing whiskey. Congress can collect those taxes, and we, we did it. There would be a problem with that that, that obviously Washington's going to deal with, but, you know, we, we the government can collect taxes, all right? The last thing is Hamilton wants to use a tariff. Now, if you don't know what a tariff is, you're going to define it. A tariff is basically a tax on another country's product that's coming into America. And the reason for doing that is to raise that product's price so hopefully people won't buy that product. They're going to buy the one that, that we make in America. Um, and uh, the other thing is going to allow the government to make money. So uh, it's going to shield the products of the nation's infant industries. So our, our, our early factories are going to be able to sell their products because Ham, uh, Hamilton's going to make sure that the other guy's product is more expensive by using that tariff, right? Uh, they didn't. They didn't use all parts of his plan, but they, they did pass other less restrictive parts of the tariff. So basically, everything Hamilton wanted to get done, he did. All right, uh, all four parts of his plan. Obviously, a little smiley face. Who's happy about this? Alexander Hamilton. Who agreed with all this? Obviously, George Washington and Congress, because they approved all parts of this plan. All right. Um, if you want to take a look at this chart, it's really nice. Right here are his goals. Here's how he went about getting that done and he does right he's he's absolute beast love hamilton it's too bad aaron burr shot him but you know what are you gonna do uh, there's some vocab for you excise tax protective tariff so if you don't know what an excise tax is you got it if you don't know what a protective tariff is you got it you want to study that vocab it's key right what happened in pennsylvania all right 1794 the government was taxing whiskey 
Well, the Western Pennsylvania farmers protested that tax. They did not like it, of course. Who likes taxes? Uh, they refused to pay that specific tax on whiskey that uh, they were making from grain. So wh why do you say farmers? Well, they weren't all drinkers, but uh, that tax on whiskey was basically uh, hurting the amount of money that they could potentially make. So they got mad. Uh, Washington called out the state militias, and uh, he basically went down there with Hamilton, with the Federal Army, and uh, he basically asked the people what the problem was, and by the time Washington got there, you better believe it, there was no problem. They were like, okay, buddy, we'll pay our taxes, because George had uh, this level of respect, and uh, no one wanted to mess with him, you know. Uh, what did he do, though? Okay, that's a great story. His actions demonstrated that the new government is going to make laws, the second part of that is they're going to enforce those federal laws. So he proved that this new government, number one, has power. Number two, can make laws. Number three, if they make a law, they are going to enforce that law. So keep that in mind when you when you remember the Whiskey Rebellion. All right. Uh, and there's kind of a painting of George going down. Obviously, he always rode the, the white horse. He's got the militia with him. And, and from, from the way the story goes, by the time he got there, everybody found out that he was coming. And uh, there wasn't really much of rebellion when he got down there. They just decided to obey the rules. All right. Um, what's going on with Washington and its foreign policy stuff? All right. Uh, from 1789 to 1815, the French Revolution and European wars that were happening uh, put a lot of pressure on America to get involved. Uh, and the question was, is, would it be a smart move for us to get involved? If we do, who should we help out? Should we help out France? Should we help out Britain? So we had some serious decisions to make as, a, as an early country. Uh, in, in our beginnings, and Washington really tried to protect us. We weren't ready to get involved in anything, so what he comes up with is keep America out of trouble. And how can we do that? The key word is stay neutral. So we're going to get to that at the end. But a couple things that he does do, all right? Uh, John Jay, who was the first chief justice, he uh, he sends him over to Britain because we had just fought them in the American Revolution. And Washington says, hey, buddy, go over there, chat with the Brits, and uh, see if we can work some stuff out. So we, uh, we make this agreement with Britain. And we say, listen, we already beat you up. We want our independence. Uh, we want to avoid war. We don't want any more problems. We would like to trade with you. You know, if you want to trade with us, well, you know, that, that's cool, right? Uh, so Jay's Treaty is a big foreign policy thing that Washington does, all right? Second one is he proclaims to the world that we're going to be neutral, right? America is not going to get in any wars. We're not going to get any conflicts. We're not going to protect France or protect Britain or, you know, we just really want to do commerce. We want to trade and make money. We're going to find out that it's not that easy to, to say that. we got to back that up, all right? So after eight years, George is like, I'm done. Uh, they would have elected him again. He could have been the president again, but he decides to go home. Um, before he leaves the presidency, he warns America about a couple things, all right? He says, first of all, do not get into a permanent alliance. Temporary alliance is okay, but don't tell a country that you've got their back forever. Because at some point, you're going to get sucked into something you don't want. So he said, permanent alliance is no good. You know, the, the other thing he said in that farewell address, said, we've got to stay neutral. Abide by what I, I warn you guys about. It's going to keep America out of trouble. And the other thing he said was, he saw these, these Federalists and these Democratic Republicans developing in these first two political parties. He didn't listen to Jefferson, who was a Democratic Republican, and Hamilton, who was a Federalist. And he's definitely not happy about the fact that there's different two different directions the country's going. So he warned America about political parties, so they're bad for the country. All right. Second president, John Adams, is elected. Uh, John Adams was around during the uh, colonial period. Um, he's a lawyer. He's smart. Uh, and he, he takes over. He's a Federalist president, right? Uh, he's the first vice president, and obviously he becomes president right after that. Um, there was a problem with France. Uh, there was this kind of undeclared naval war happening with France. We were trading with Britain. France would attack our, our naval ships, our merchant ships. So uh, it was kind of, it was referred to as the quasi-war. I mean, we, we were going to war, but it wasn't um, declared. Congress didn't declare war. It was just kind of happening. And there was this, this problem that Adams had to deal with. So uh, the, the best thing he thought to do was uh, send some guys over to talk to the French. So uh, we sent three envoys to uh, meet with the French and negotiate uh, some peace. When we get there, we get to France, there's three agents who uh, 
tell us that if we pay them uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars, that uh, we'll, we we can see the French Foreign Minister Maurice de Talleyrand. He's the French guy. Uh, we obviously did not pay them that bribe. Uh, Americans are outraged. Our respect for France is going downhill at this point, and uh, we're really not happy with the French. Uh, a lot of John Adams' political party, a lot of the Federalists are asking him to go to war. He said, we should go fight the French, like, for real. Call up Congress, tell them to declare war, it's time to go. And uh, Adams does not do that. He doesn't think America is ready, and uh, he feels diplomacy is the, the, the better fit. So even though we're mad about this little XYZ affair, Adams sends a second group of envoys, and he basically tells the French, we're not playing around. we we got to work something out. And uh, at that second meeting, we, we do get the chance to sit down and discuss things. So Adams, even though his people want him to go to war, he does not. So we have kind of avoid an all-out war with the French, although we were kind of fighting them out in the uh, out in the high seas there, right? Uh, Adam's political party is so mad at him, he does not win a second term. So he's only the president for four years, and uh, it kind of leads to this bitter, bitter dispute over you know, how strong a Federalist leader should be. Uh, but uh, he doesn't win, and uh, he goes back home and does his thing. Also, our alliance with France is over. I mean, we had a 1778 alliance with them. After the Battle of Saratoga, they came and they, they helped us out. They helped us beat the British during the Revolutionary War. And we kind of, we were like, hey, you know, you want to help us? We'll help you. Everything's good. But once they started to do this, this bribe and stealing our, our, our goods, and uh, they, we just were like, we're, we're pretty much done with you. Um, what happens in 1800, though? We do have a peaceful and independent entry into the 1800s. Things with France have kind of calmed down. And uh, John Adams is a Federalist. He loses an election. And uh, Thomas Jefferson walks into the White House. And uh, nobody dies, right? Uh, the one domestic issue you want to know about in terms of John Adams is um, he creates these laws. He, he basically works with Congress to create these laws. They're known as the Alien and Sedition Acts. If you don't know what these are, you'll define them in a moment. But you, you better know what these two are, right? Uh, and who made these laws? So you got to understand political parties. The people were the Federalists. They passed these laws specifically to attack the Democratic Party. All right. So if you remember that about those laws, it's a good point. What are the Alien Acts? All right. Well, uh, we're not talking about aliens from Mars. We're talking about people living in America who are not citizens yet. Okay. And the Alien Act made it much more difficult to become a citizen. Um, Basically, it changed the, uh, the the terms. You you had a, you wanted people to live here for 14 years before they can attain citizenship. Uh, and the old rule was only five years. You'd be here five years to become a citizen. Now he's saying you got to be here 14 years, which obviously you know takes takes a lot longer. I mean, people didn't wait that long, you know. Uh, also, he said we're going to arrest people and throw them out of the country. We're going to deport them that we don't like. So basically, he was attacking, and he was a Federalist, and who don't they like? Well, they don't like the people from the other political party. So that was kind of dirty, but that's what the Federalists did, right? The Sedition Acts are, are even more hated. The term sedition means criticizing or, or talking bad about the, the government or the governmental people in charge. And uh, what the law said was it made it very easy to arrest someone for criticizing the government, and you even put them in jail. So you say, you know, John Adams is a bad president. All of a sudden, next day, you're, you're arrested and you're put in jail. Why were these laws hated so much? They are basically a violation of freedom of speech. You guessed it. They're taking away our First Amendment rights. So we'll deal with those later on, right? There's, there's poor little Thomas Jefferson, right? You could be a, a citizen in five years. What did the Alien Act do? It changed the five years to 14 years, right? Now you're not so happy. Sorry, Jefferson. What are you going to do? Uh, what are the reactions? People don't like it. I, right? what? Well, there's tons of protests about this because they're just they're not good laws. All right, uh, freedom of the speech and the press are being taken away. So they, they, they did not like that Sedition Act. Well, Jefferson's not happy with that. He's a Democratic Republican. Madison's not happy about that. He's a Democratic Republican. But they really can't come out and say anything because then they'll go to jail. So what they do very cleverly is. Uh, they draft these resolutions. So these resolutions, the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, they're written by Madison, they're written by Jefferson, but they don't attach their name to them. They kind of just float them out there so people can see them. And what these resolutions say 
It says that, that those laws, the Alien and Sedition Acts, are so dangerous to civil liberties, so dangerous to representative government, that uh, states should have the power to get rid of them. So Thomas Jefferson, they wanted to say something, but they can't. So, you know, like the little joke says here, don't tell Adams we said it, but the Alien and Sedition Acts are whack, right? They're no good. Uh, the last thing you want to know is, uh, you know, some of the uh, traditions that Washington sets up as we go through. Uh, he rejected a third term. He could have been president again. He goes home, right? He establishes a tradition that is not broken until 1940 to 1944. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he wins a fourth unprecedented term. It's never happened before, all right? After that, the 22nd Amendment is passed by Congress in 1951 and limits the presidency to only two terms. Easy way to remember that. It's the 22nd Amendment, two terms. Say it, two, two, two. 22nd Amendment, two terms, right? Two, two, two. Hopefully you remember that, right? Um, here's Amendment 22. Sorry, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, because of you, now we have that, that amendment, right? You can't only be the president for eight full years, right? Uh, there's some structures of government that are created. I'm going to find this pretty easy, right? Uh, congressional action set up what is called the machinery. The bulk of the governmental work is done in Congress, right? The Constitution establishes the Supreme Court, but Congress can establish the lower courts. So they pass the Judiciary Act of 1789 that creates the rest of the federal court system. We always talk about the Supreme Court, but realize that there are different levels of government and there are other federal courts that are out there, all right? Uh, Congress creates, or, you know, officially, you know, Washington does this, but Congress agrees with it and basically creates the first five executive departments. We pretty much call this a cabinet, right? Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of War, which today we, we simply call that the Secretary of Defense, the Attorney General, and then the Postmaster General. Okay, so those are those are the right. Now, obviously, who was the first postmaster general? I believe it was Ben Franklin. Loved it. He, he got the news out there. Uh, today, there are over 15 departments or 15 cabinet positions, but also there are over 200 independent agencies that help the president function. CIA, FBI, TSA. You know some of these names that are out there. There's over 200 of them. Plus the 15 cabinet positions. So there's a lot, all right? Uh, there's a little judge for it, right? Judiciary Act 1789 sets up the federal court system. President gets to nominate the judges, but Congress set up, uh, you know, what those courts were going to be and how many of them, how many districts. The one thing that we didn't know was going to happen that actually did happen can also be considered part of the unwritten Constitution. Uh, our government created a Congress, but Congress actually together decided to split up the workload in Congress by creating committees. So you won't find committee systems in the Constitution, but Congress, both the House of Representatives and the Senate, split up their membership into different committees. All right. Uh, so in 1789, what Congress did is began assigning bills to committees. All right. The committee system developed. It's still around today. Uh, standing committees review all bills before assigning them to the full House or the Senate. And congressional committees have taken an investigative role on laws and governmental actions, right? So depending on, uh, you know, what, what those committees are, I mean, they're actually the ones who start an investigation on the president in terms of impeachment, and uh, they, they have a lot of power. So don't, don't forget about committees, all right? If you want to take a peek at the amount of committees, they're there. So... In the House, there are standing committees. These, these never go away. There's a committee on agriculture. There's a committee on governmental reform. There's a committee on science. So obviously, if there's a problem with our farmers, well, obviously, that committee is going to begin the discussion on how to fix the problem. Over in the Senate, there's a bunch of other standing committees that they have. And then obviously, we have joint committees of Congress. So these are committees that pretty much pull in members of the House and members of the Senate, and they work together to create laws that our country needs. So just give me a kind of idea of the, the, how the committee system is set up, all right? Uh, it's a vocab term. I'm going to give you time to get it. Uh, you, you want to know what, you know what committees do, where they're located, and uh, their role in our government, all right? Uh, the other part of the governmental structure that developed for George Washington were lobbyists, all right? 
and what lobbyists are, are people who represent special interest groups. What they do is they try to get Congress to make a law that's going to benefit their group. That's what they do. And why they get that name, the, the lobbyists? Well, you know, it said back in the, uh, you know, the early days, these people would kind of hang out in the lobby. And they would try to grab these congressmen before they got into doing their work. And they tried to influence them. Have a little quick five-minute chat with them. Tell them what you want. Hopefully, they're going to go in there and do it for you. All right? Lobbying is also protected by the First Amendment. Why? Part of the First Amendment says you have the right to petition your government. And basically, what lobbyists do is they're asking the government, they're petitioning the government to do something for them. Realize that, that lobbying, there is regulations. Uh, you know, lobbyists can't say, hey, I really like you to make this law, and here's a nice check for $5,000. Uh, that's kind of like, uh, that's maybe like a little illegal, right? So certain uh, regulations are put on lobbyists to make sure the process is fair, to make sure that, uh, you know, we're actually creating laws that our country needs, not, not just what, uh, what one particular group would want, all right? So lobbying, vocab, you want to get it down, attempt to influence legislation, or groups that attempt to do the same, all right? Last little piece is, uh, you know, kind of when you're looking at how our government functions, they're part of uh, the two political party system here, is you know, how do you view the Constitution, all right? And when you look at what Hamilton did, his financial plan for that bank started the national debate over what should the government be doing. Well, there's two ways to look at that. You can either be strict or you can be loose. And... What do strict constructionists view, right? A very narrow interpretation of the Constitution. And I know kids struggle with that narrow. So look at this one right here. They believe the government should only do the things that are written down in the Constitution. If it doesn't say we can do it, then we can't do it. All right? On the flip side of that, if you're loosey-goosey, right, uh, they fear a very broader, very freer reading of the Constitution. And they believe that the government does, should be able to do more than just what is written down. And their, their viewpoint, if you're loose, you're saying, hey, the Constitution didn't tell me I couldn't do it, so that must mean I can do it. And, and how uh, can the, the government do more than what's written? They're, they're basically using the implied powers of the elastic clause. And if you don't remember that, there's that little clause, the 18th clause that Congress has, and they say they can do anything they think is necessary and proper. Well, if you think you know the government should need a, a national bank, if that's necessary and proper, then you do it. But realize when you're doing that, you're very loose. If you're strict, you wouldn't build that national bank. Why? Because the Constitution doesn't tell you you can. So there's two different ways to view how our government can function. And we, we can kind of review or analyze and look at different uh, presidential decisions. And you can even slot them as, hey, man, that was real strict. Or, whoa, this guy's really loose. He's doing a lot. All right? You see that. There's some vocab. You know, if you want to pause it to get those down, you can get that. Some quick test tips, all right, for Washington and Adams. Uh, you, you should know what precedents are and have some examples of those. All right? Uh, his former policy plan would be strictly to stay neutral. Uh, Hamilton's plan, we went over four parts of that. So if you don't know those four parts and what he did for our, our national debt at the time, you might want to go back and review that. Uh, Washington farewell address says two things. Stay neutral. Political parties are bad for the country, right? They're going to split us apart. Uh, then you got Adams. So the three, three, three big events under Adams would be the Alien and Sedition Acts, Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions, and then the XYZ Affair. And uh, my man third period would probably say, yeah, buddy. Stay tuned, because the next video will be on Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe. See you guys soon.